I want to continue and even conclude the series that we've been in called Unearth. We're talking about calling and unearthing our calling. Genesis chapter 2. Go there with me. Genesis chapter 2. There are two creation narratives. Genesis 1 is very broad. It's broad strokes. Uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, God created um, and he saw that it was good. You know, let there be light. Uh, let us make man in our image, give them dominion. I mean, just very broad strokes. And then by the time you get to Genesis 2, the narrative gets very specific. Man now has a name. His name is Adam. And out of Adam comes Eve. And, and, and we, we, we see the very specifics that the, that the writers through the Holy Spirit are trying to get us to understand about the mind and the creativity of God. Today, we're going we're gonna to set the stage to talk about what is our personal calling? And what is one of the ways that we will manifest and work this calling out in the most earthy, daily minutia of life? I mean, I mean, no other way to say it. It, it. it begins here in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. It was gravel and dirt. And he formed the man. And he breathed. Just like breathing into a, a balloon or blowing a candle, just blowing. He, he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostril, and the man became a living person. Jump down to verse 15. Then, it says, verse 15, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it, to tend it, to steward it, to take care of it, to work it, to watch over it, to have dominion, to co-create with God. Here's what I want to talk about today. We've been in this series. We've talked about universal calling, that God breathed. He breathed the breath of life into humankind. The DNA, the image of God is on your DNA. He created you and me to reflect his image, his character. We are unique in creation in that we carry his image. And you don't even have to believe in God and you still carry his image. And what God wants to do, though, through the gospel of Jesus Christ is unearth the fact that we're not just image bearers of his, but we are actually royal priests We are in the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what we looked at last week in this kingdom calling, that we have a kingdom calling to step into rooms and to spaces and bring the goodness of God there. It should change. The atmosphere should shift the moment that you and I, image bearers of God, calling and creating with him, and together bringing the Spirit of God through the gospel into the room to reconcile brokenness back to himself. I don't know about you, but I am fired up that I am called to be a bridge builder, to be a way maker, because that's who God is. He makes a way where there is no way. Where there are obstacles, he removes them. Where there are chasms, he bridges them. And then he says, I want you to join me in this. Anybody with me in this? Come on, let's go, let's go. Today, though, I want to talk about our personal calling. This is what I want to say to us today. Uh, I believe that, that our work and ministry in the local church will have profound influence in the kingdom of God. It will. When men and women step up to give their time and energy to the local church, uh, to, to the mission of the local church, they receive and live out their spiritual giftings and the practicalities of ministry. Profound influence in the kingdom of God. You want to know, though, where you will have even more profound influence? And this is what I want to talk about today. In fact, 90% of your kingdom influence as a believer and follower of Jesus or a potential will happen not necessarily in the local church. I think some of you will be the next Billy Graham and you will 
teach and preach the gospel to masses of people and generations will be impacted. I think sitting in this room or tuning in online, someone is gonna be the next C.S. Lewis and write the next mere Christianity. I think somebody will, through the ideations of the Holy Spirit and their obedience, form the next organization that will be like Samaritan's Purse or Compassion International or, or, I mean, vast influence you will have in your organizational skills and yet, 90% of us will have the most impact for the kingdom of God in this place. What am I talking about? The place you go to work. Yep. If you want to know how to have the simplest, most regular, most earthy, ground level yet impactful ministry for the gospel of Jesus Christ, show up to work and do a good job. I would drop this mic, but they would kick me off stage if I did that. I want to say that again, because I don't think you got me. The most impactful thing you will do for the kingdom of God the ministry of reconciliation is in the local church, yes. Is in your home, yes. But half of your waking hours and mine will be at the place that I go to work, the place that you go to work. And the impact that you and I can have for the kingdom of God is to show up to work and do a good job. Why? Because work, as we see in Genesis 2, 7, and 15, work is part of God's plan, calling, and blessing for humankind. It is part of God's blessing for humankind that we get to go to work and we get to co-create and we get to use the unique personality and the unique gifting and the unique experiences that God has given us to bring order to chaos and to bring life to death. Mm. But we don't always get this, do we? Turn with me to Genesis chapter three. We're gonna get to that in just a second. While you're turning there, I wanna pray for us. Father, take this word and disrupt us in the name of Jesus. I pray that today as I pray, that someone will step into a bold calling in their workplace. Lord, I think you're calling someone out of a place and into a new and daring place. I think you're calling today people to lead, to rise up in their workplaces. Where they have been fearful or insecure, Lord, you are gonna download new levels of courage and humility. I pray that spiritual giftings would enact in this place today that where there was confusion or misunderstanding, Lord, you would bring clarity and boldness. Let your spirit, your word, and your people today allow us to step boldly into ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. I started work when I was probably two or three. My mom said, clean up this mess. Right? And you probably did too. And what you didn't know when your mom or the Sunday school teacher was singing that little jingle, clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere, clean up, clean up, everybody do their share. That actually in that little simple act of cleaning up, you and I were bringing more heaven to earth. Now, some of you are not convinced. Some of you think this is hyperbole. Some of you think this is over-exaggeration. Would you please just get to the theology of the Trinity or something super deep before I have to go to La Carretta? It's always La Carretta. And I get that. I understand that. You don't want to hear from me today. Just go to work and do a good job because it sounds so simple and so... I don't know, elementary, and yet it is the most profound ministry that you and I will have. Here's the thing, though. When I was seven years old, 
My dad introduced me to the lawnmower. I don't even know if I could, I mean, I was literally mowing the lawn like this, I'm sure. When I was 10, he introduced me to the wood pile. The wood pile that I would have to move from one side of the, the yard to the other side of the yard two times a year. It, it seemed so futile. And I can remember grumbling. Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do this? Curse this work. Curse my life. I'm a man of unclean lips. Hmm. Work. We sometimes resent our work. And I want to lean into that. Why do we do that? Why do we resent our work? And we're going, to, we're going to get to the origins of that. But some of you would say, yes, there has been seasons, I'm sitting in one right now, where I resent and I resist work. And I'm not just talking about my occupation. I'm not just talking about the, the, play, the retail place that I go or the office space that I go or the little side business that I run or the computer that I program, whatever, whatever. But there's something in you that says, I just wish I could please myself and stay on the couch and everything would come to me via Amazon, right? And that DoorDash would just show up and say, you know what, we were in the neighborhood, here's a pizza, you don't even have to pay for it. We resent, at times in our life, work. We resent sweating. My parents moved out of their house in Salem, Virginia, this weekend into my basement. You guys pray for us right now, right now. Just, we're gonna pause and pray. No, I'm just kidding. No, they are um, transitioning from uh, their home there in Salem and they're relocating here for the next season of their life. And, and uh, I was driving to their house in Salem and there was part of me that was just like, I don't wanna move. I don't wanna pick up couches and boxes. You know, and then I was reminded of, you know, the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother for your days will be long in the land. I think, I just want to die. <laughs> look, look, I'm just being honest with you guys. So I'm driving to my parents' house and, and, and you know, we're going we're gonna to spend the, the day, you know, moving things into a truck. And, and as I was getting closer, I was just reminded of this, wait a minute, what is it about me that just resents this? What is it about me that resists this? There is some kind of curse on this thing that Jesus actually died and rose from the dead to redeem. And so I had to shift my whole mentality I had to have a revival in the truck on the way there and go, wait a minute, this is an opportunity to bless. This is an opportunity to say, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to help. So by the time I stepped out of the truck, I was the Mother Teresa of U-Haul. Come on, come on, somebody got that. We don't realize, though, that when we show up on the scene, we can either bring light or darkness. And sometimes we don't understand the theology behind it. But there is a war that we have. There is a resistance. There is, as Tanner said, there's ideas that we have a spiritual enemy that wants to say, work is a curse. Work is a curse. Resent it, resist it. And then what we do is we try to escape from it. And as a result, we miss the joy and the purpose that God wants to bring. Sometimes we minimize our work. Let me talk about this for a second. Some of you go to work and you don't mind going to work. You don't resent it. You don't resist it. But there's a part of you that just minimizes it. You know, I am just a clerk at Walmart. I am just a plumber, a baker, a candlestick maker. I'm just a manager. I'm just a stay-at-home parent. I am just a, and you, you and I can get in these seasons in our life where we minimize what we do. It doesn't matter. It's not making any difference in the world. I'm just dot, dot, dot. And the reality is that even the simplest order that we bring to chaos and the simplest life we bring to death in the labor of our hands, in the 
ideas and creativity and the actions that they produce brings a little bit more of heaven to this earth and shines a light on the redemptive power of Jesus. Wow, really? Some of you who are stay-at-home parents who are changing diapers are like, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. But here's what I want to say. That child that you're caring for right now, that child that you're caring for is going to, to, to grow up. And that child is going to, to know at every stage that you have parented and guide, guided that child that the work that you've done and the responsibility that you've taken to be their parent is actually one of the closest and most vivid pictures of their heavenly father. Mm. Mm. The work and the responsibility. Do not minimize driving your child to school and helping him or her with their homework. Lean into that. Yes, it's labor. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it takes your energy. Do not minimize the impact. Does your kid want you to be there in the big moments? Does my son and my daughter want me to be there at their weddings? Did my daughter want me to walk her down the aisle when she got, absolutely, yes. Did they want me to be there in the big show and the programs that they were in at school? Yes, but more than anything, they wanted me to be across the table saying, two plus two equals four. Hmm. Sometimes though we minimize that. Today we're going to walk out of here and understand that minimizing our work is not, is not going to bring joy and purpose. Sometimes we worship our work. Some of you would say, yep, I'm in that season right now where I'm worshiping my work. It, it's become my identity. It's become everything to me. I'm, I'm doing, doing, doing. I'm creating, 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 and I have no time for rest or relationships or whatever rest and relationship I have is, is just minute at best. And I'm exhausted and I'm tired and I don't have any emotional margin and somebody sneezes and I'm about to go off, right? Somebody cuts you off at Walmart gets your self-checkout before you get there and you're ready to go and take hostages. What's going on? I am overworked. I am worshiping my work. I have to work because I have to pay my bills and I have to pay this and I have to have enough money in the bank. And so I go to work and, oh, wow, I don't want to go home and be with those crazy people who live at home. So I'm going to stay at work and, and work, work, work. And we don't say no to, to, to our employers and say, you know what, I can't do that because there's some other things in my life that are important. We have made work an idol. Listen, here's the problem. Here's what we're going to solve. To resent, minimize, or worship work misses the joy and the purpose God designed and redeemed for work. So where did work get weird? Where did it get weird for us? Where did it start to be something that we either resisted or resented? Where did it become something that we minimize? Where did it become something that we worship? Genesis chapter three is when sin enters the human story, right? Like you know, Tanner alluded to it today that 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 an idea was cast to Eve and then eventually Adam. Did God really say that if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that you would die. Did he really, or maybe is he holding out on you? And of course, we know the story. The story is that, that Adam and Eve said, yeah, we, we, we'll get on board with this and we'll question God. And they then had the knowledge of evil as well as the knowledge of good. And it says that there were ramifications to this. Genesis three seventeen, And the man said, and, and, and to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is, and I want you to say this word with me, it is cursed. Say it with me again. It is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Whoo! It is cursed. What does that word curse means? It means that it is bound up 
and limited. Where it once was boundless and thriving, it now has limitations. We are introduced to the work curse dichotomy. Ooh, what is that? Sounds fancy. Work gives us provision and purpose, but also frustration and futility. The very thing that gives us provision and purpose is the very thing the next day that will give us frustration and futility. You pull one weed and three more are waiting on you tomorrow. Oh, I thought I got, oh, are, are you kidding me? I thought we were, I thought we were making progress. The work curse dichotomy. There's dichotomies all throughout Genesis 3. One of them is this, and that is, he says to the woman, you will want your husband to lead you, but when he does, you will resent it. Mm, I knew it would be quiet up in here. Mm, somebody just tuned out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're not done with this. He says to the woman, you will want your husband to lead you. You want him to guide you, but then you will resent it. Because why? Because sin has entered the story, and he will leverage his physical strength and his aggressiveness against you to put you down. And then all of a sudden, we have the whole Old Testament. Whew, I'm exhausted. And there's this back and forth. And then Jesus comes, right? And what does he do to that dichotomy? He breaks the curse. And he says to the man, lay down your life for her. Take your natural aggression and your natural strength and sacrifice on her behalf so that she will not even have to think about going. Should I follow this man? She will in some subconscious way because you are exemplifying mutual respect and mutual submission to her. She will think to herself, wow, there's something about this man that I trust and I feel safe in. Where did that come from? Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus took what was cursed in Genesis 3 and he redeemed it. And we can, because of the Holy Spirit and the word of God and his holy people around us, we can walk in that redemption. And I'm gonna tell you something, men and women, if we will do that in our houses, if we will do that in our marriages and our future marriages, more of heaven will come to this earth. Humility and courage, men, is the greatest aphrodisiac. Someone's like, what's that? Sexual attractiveness, okay? I said it. Humility and courage. I want to come up with that fragrance. You can already see the ad campaign. Humility. Yeah. You guys with me? I'm, I'm going to get back to that work dichotomy for a second, but this is free stuff. This is free stuff. Men, if we are humble and we are courageous and we lay down our life and we say, I will use the strength and I will use the natural assertiveness of my masculinity. Most men are more assertive and physically stronger than most women. If we would say, I'm gonna use that not to dominate you or oppress you or put you in some place or use you. Instead, I am going to build a platform for you to be everything that God has created and designed you to be. What just happened? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you imagine if we unleash those kinds of men onto an unsuspecting public? I believe revival would happen. And we would push back the divorce rate and we would bring back light. Anybody with me on this? Mm. All right. First Corinthians 
chapter 10. Turn there with me. Why does God put a dichotomy on work and then redeem it through Jesus? Here's why. The curse on work drives us to rely upon God for purpose. Here's the thing. Any time, and we see this throughout the scripture, that man began to get it, right? Began to go, oh, wow, God's given us these gifts and he's given us these ability, you know, he's given us these talents, he's given us the fruit of our labor. Eventually, the fruit of the labor and the productivity of that that brought natural wealth became what man worshiped. We see this in Genesis 10 and 11, right? The brick, man, out of the earth, forms a brick. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, hey guys, we can stack these. Yeah, really, yeah. And if we stack these, we can form things with them. And we have Genesis 10 and 11, which is the Tower of Babel. The first moment where man uses technology, the brick, to say, we don't need you anymore, God. Man, weren't they messed up? Aren't you glad that we live in an age where we do not let technology and the products of our hands become idols? (laughs) Dramatic laugh, step back, let the sarcasm filter. We're still doing it, aren't we? We still let technology, it wasn't a brick, it's now a screen, right? It's now the convenience of our modern life. It's now, and, and, and here's the thing, here's the thing. The very thing that we produce is the very thing that became, becomes God to us. And so what God does is he builds inside of work this dichotomy that says, you will need it to produce and you will need it to provide, and you will need it for some form of purpose, and yet you'll never truly find fulfillment in it. You'll never truly go, I don't need anything else. We see this over and over. You can build a barn and you can fill it, and you still will feel empty inside. And yet, Jesus' death and resurrection redeems the curse of work. You say, how does he do that? How does he do that? Paul is one of many writers in the New Testament that tells us of this. Paul says this to the church, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all, all of it for the glory of God. Everything that you do, even when you eat and when you drink. He's talking about, hey, there's a big context here. But what Paul is doing and what Paul always does seemingly is he, he goes back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and he pulls from it and he gets practical with the church in it. And he goes back to the teachings of Jesus and he pulls them right into the practicality of the life of the believer in the church. What did Jesus say is the greatest command? He actually said it's two. And you can't separate them. And what are they? Love the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Strength, your physical vitality, the work of your hands. Love God with what you produce. Love God. Work is a psychological, spiritual, sociological energy in our life. It affects everything. Ultimately, he says, love God with your strength. And oh, by the way, simultaneously, the most practical and best way you can love God is to love your neighbor as yourself. What does Jesus do to the work of our hands? He says, how you do it and what you do 
is a way of worshiping God by taking care of your neighbor. How I work, the attitude in which I show up to work, affects the kingdom of God. Happy to be here, happy to help. What I do in the simplest form makes a difference. Why? Because Jesus died and rose from the dead. Happy to be here, mom and dad. Happy to help. What I do here makes a difference because Jesus died and rose from the dead. When you hang sheetrock, when you interact with a customer at work, when you sign a contract, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. When you pick up a rock or a log or a brick and move it from one place to the other and you stack it and you make something with it, that is a moment where you and I can give glory to God. What? Happy to be here. Happy to help. Our work can make the gospel visible by what we do and how we do it. You know, Jesus was a carpenter. Now, a lot of people, when they think of a carpenter, they think of a woodworker, and, and that is true, you know, cabinet maker and makes tables and and, and we know the modern idea of a carpenter, but Jesus didn't live near any trees. What they mainly built things with in Nazareth was rock. Jesus likely built a lot of things, not from wood, although he did, but mostly from rock. Jesus, for the first 30 years of his life, was a construction worker. He wore Carhartt to work, legitimately. Calluses on his hands, picked up rocks and stacked them. And then he became a rabbi. Our work can make the gospel visible by what we do and how we do it. Paul says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean in the practicalities of our work? It means that we got to check our attitude, right? I mean, for real. Every, everything that I show up to, whether it's moving my parents whether it is mopping a floor, whether it's showing up on a Sunday morning to practice ministry in a local church. It's a moment where I get to love my neighbor, but it's a moment where I get to check my attitude. Why am I doing this? And by what strength and energy am I doing this? I get to do this. Why do I get to do this? Because I was separated from God. What I was entitled to was death and separation, death and hell, and yet Jesus came and he died. He died. He took that construction worker body and let it be broken on a cross for me and you and anyone who would believe broken for you and me. His blood was spilt so that all of the sins that once made me an offense and an enemy of God and a destroyer of my own life, my own psychology, my own heart, the own, my own work of the hands that would bring death, he redeemed all of that on that cross and in that empty tomb by raising from the dead, planting the same spirit that rose him from the dead in anyone who would believe in his church. And the moment that happens, it redeems the curse of work. 
And all of the sudden, I wake up every day with the breath of God in me to say, happy to be here. Blessed, blessed to be here. And I'm happy to help. Why? Because Jesus hung on a cross for me. And he rose from the dead. And everything I do right now for the rest of my earthly life is to bring glory to God, even showing up at work. And I think some of you right now, you're in a tough season. You're going to a job that you don't like. You resent it. If you're honest, you just resent it. You don't want to do it. You don't like the people that you work with. You don't like management. You, you have your story. You have your list. What would happen if right now you just shifted? You just shifted. Say, God, if this is the job that you've, uh, you've, you've given me, if this is the door that you opened me, help me be the next C.S. Lewis, the next Mother Teresa, the next Billy Graham, the next T.D. Jakes at my work. Happy to be here. Happy to help. Happy to be here. Happy to. Hey, you guys need anything? I'm I'm here. Can you imagine those kind of people? Like how the politics of the workplace would just start to dissipate because you're not holding on to things and you're not fighting things. You're just trying to build bridges and remove obstacles for people to be who God's created and designed them to be. You walk into the room and all of a sudden the goodness of God shows up with you. And you're putting stamps on letters, you're mopping floors, you're balancing the books, you're leading the team, whatever it is. I think it's something that we have to just stop and go, what is my attitude right now? Would you stand with me? Just bow your heads with me. If you're, if you're tuning in online, you know, even if you're in a coffee shop, just, just bow your head. Just create some sacred space right now. And just pray this prayer. God, what is my attitude right now for the work of, hand, of my hands? Is it about me? Have I made my job uh, something to resent or minimize or worship? God, if that's, if that's the case, I would just repent of that. Just, just repent of it. Just right now, just say, God, I, I, I give that to you. Change my attitude. Shift my attitude. Let me see the people that I work with as image bearers, as your children. Next, just in that same line of thinking, check your quality. Check your quality. Are you stewarding the opportunities? Or would you just say, you know, right now, man, if I'm honest, I'm cutting corners. I'm cutting corners in everything. I'm cutting corners in my parenting. I'm cutting corners in my, in my, in my homework. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting corners in my, in my work work. Because I just, I don't care. I don't care about the quality of my work. Just right now, just confess that. Just say, you know what? Wait a minute. I'm not giving my best. And, and I, and God, I, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 want to, I want to give my best to your glory, for your glory. Not for my own, but for your glory. Just in this moment, just go, God, how, how am I stewarding right now this opportunity that you've given me? Maybe you're going to move somebody out of their house this week. And instead of going, oh man, I got to do this. Instead of going, man, I get to do this. I get to, do, I get to serve somebody. I get to help somebody. And I'm going to give my best to it. And then finally, let God right now affirm purpose in you. Just let him, let him breathe on you right now. I think he's, I think he's doing something in our, in our church right now. I think he's downloading something. In, and we're going to have nights of worship and we're going to have preaching and teaching and we're going to have small groups and community groups and we're going to have opportunities to, to serve people compassionately. But, but we're also going to call you and me to go into the marketplace and to go in the workplace and be a light by just simply saying, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to help. 
What I do matters because Jesus died and rose from the dead. And I'm just going to bring the goodness of God wherever it is I go. Whatever it is that I do, I'm going to bring glory to Him. And I'm going to start with where I spend most of my waking hours, most of my life. So right now, I want to remind you that if you're in the room, our response stations are are open if you want to take communion today. If you're tuning in, uh, go to your cupboard, go to your refrigerator, find some crackers and some juice and and sit there or maybe even administer it with the people that are in the in the house with you. But if you're in this room, we have the 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 bread and the wine, we have the body and the blood of Christ represented today. And, and Jesus says this, do this in remembrance of me. If today you just need to step out while, while we sing and while we worship and song, just, just step out and, and go take communion. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I've done for you to redeem everything in your life that was once cursed by sin. Wow. If you need to light a candle of intercessory prayer, just you're praying for somebody. You're, you're, you're praying. We, we had an opportunity to pray for a, a a young girl right before the service today who was rushed to the hospital this morning. We're praying for people this weekend who uh, Marcus and Sophia Thomas, Marcus lost his mother to a battle with cancer this weekend. Pray, pray, just, like, just pray for that family right now. Maybe you know some people that that are are wrestling with health issues or and you, or. Their, their child is, is, is wayward and you just want to pray them back to, to God. I mean, whatever it is, just light that candle. Say, God, today, I know there's nothing, uh, nothing mystical necessarily about this. It's just, just representate. I'm just praying for, for this person and you can call them by name. I, I want to invite you to do that. But you know what? This space is always open every week for prayer. If you're in this room and you're just like, man, I hate my job and I'm starting to resent it more and more every day. And I just need, I just need this church to get around me and pray for my heart right now. Don't even wait for us to start singing. Just come down. Maybe, maybe you, you would just say, man, I love my job, but I've made it an idol. Or maybe you would just say, man, I, 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 I don't, you know, I don't hate my job, but I don't really see the, the, the work of my hands making a difference. But God, I, I really want you to help download a, a, a fresh wind and a fresh fire for me in this season of my life so that I can see my workplace and, 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 and my work life and my work leadership as a, as a, as a way to glorify you. Like, just come down here. Or, or maybe you just need right now to step in and, and be commissioned into a new season of ministry. And you need this church to get around you. Or maybe you need physical healing. Physical healing right now. Or spiritual and emotional healing right now. Let this church minister to you. Let the Spirit of God in the people of God, fueled by the Word of God, do what only the people of God can do together. And that is see the power of God rest in community. Maybe that's you today. Come on down here. Let us pray around. Don't, you know, look, those person say, hey, look, would you just go with me? Would you just go with me? Maybe you say, hey, I'm not, I'm not supposed to go, go for, forward, but man, I just need to drop right now to my knees. Maybe you need to look to the person beside you. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me right now? Let's start right now a revival in the workplace a revival in the work of our hands let's pray let's be commissioned and then let's go make a way for this world